On behalf of our team, I'd like to welcome you to Mount Carmel New Albany Surgical Hospital. We are delighted that you have chosen our hospital for your health care needs. We are dedicated to providing you with the best in surgical care. Let us know how we can make your stay with us as pleasant and rewarding as possible. The Mount Carmel New Albany Surgical Hospital specializes in the surgical treatment of bone, joints, and spine. The video presentation you are about to see has been created especially for you. We believe that the more information you have about your procedure, the better you'll be able to help make it a success. In this video presentation, you and your family will learn about your diagnosis, the procedure that you are going to have, and what to expect during your recovery. Most importantly, you will learn what you will need to do to prepare for your surgery, as well as what you can and cannot do after the operation during the rehabilitation period. If you have any questions when you finish watching this video presentation, please ask your nurse or contact your surgeon or their clinical staff. All patients are required to have pre-admission testing before surgery to assess if you are medically fit to tolerate the surgery. This may be scheduled with your primary care physician or discussed with your surgeon. All testing must be completed one week prior to your scheduled surgery date. Your doctor will advise you as to whether he wants you to keep taking your routine medication or not. Please be sure to review the patient information book that was given to you at your doctor's office and bring it with you to the hospital. Make arrangements with a friend or family member to accompany you on the day of surgery. Do not eat, drink, or smoke after midnight the night before your surgery unless instructed to do so by your doctor. This includes chewing gum, breath mints, or sips of water. Smoking must be stopped before the surgery and not resumed after the surgery in order to reduce the risk of wound infection and delayed healing. Check with your doctor to see how far in advance of the surgery you need to stop smoking. Smokers have twice the rate of wound infections, longer recovery periods, and are more prone to post-operative complications, especially involving the lungs. When you first arrive at the hospital, you will check in at the front desk located in the main lobby. From there, you will be directed to the registration department to complete any remaining paperwork. Please remember to bring a picture ID, your insurance card, and any required financial responsibility. We accept personal checks as well as major credit cards. Once your paperwork is complete, you will be escorted to our pre-operative waiting area. We request that your family remain in the waiting area during surgery so that our staff is able to keep them updated on the progress of your surgery. At the end of your procedure, your physician will speak to your designated family member either in the waiting area or on the telephone. If your family member needs to leave the waiting area and does not have a cell phone, we will provide one for their use while you are in surgery. Your family will be free to rejoin you once you arrive in our inpatient department located on the second floor. Finally, for the health of our patients, families, visitors, and staff, the Mount Carmel New Albany Surgical Hospital and campus are tobacco and smoke free. Prior to your surgery, you will be asked to sign a consent form, which allows your doctor to perform your surgery. Make sure you understand the procedure, risks, and options prior to signing. If you have any questions, please ask to speak to your surgeon before signing. On the day of your surgery, an anesthesia provider will talk with you to discuss what type of anesthesia you will receive. The anesthesia team consists of an anesthesiologist, who is a doctor specialized in the field of anesthesiology and a certified registered nurse anesthetist or CRNA. Aside from back and neck surgery, most orthopedic procedures can be performed with regional or nerve block anesthesia in combination with some type of sedation or general anesthesia so that you can still be asleep during your operation. Regional anesthesia offers many advantages over straight general anesthesia. It is less stressful on the body and it allows the team to use less anesthesia medication by concentrating the anesthetic on the area of surgery. This minimizes side effects like grogginess or nausea that many people experience. You will also wake up much more comfortably and usually can leave the hospital sooner as well. 
If you decide on a regional technique, it will be performed in the preoperative area only after we make sure that you are very comfortable with IV sedation. You will then be taken to the operating room suite where you will be given medication to help you fall asleep. One or more of the anesthesia team members will be with you throughout your operation. During surgery, we are working very closely to your nerves. Nerve injury can occur, but may improve or recover over time. Other infrequent risks or complications are bladder infections, delayed wound healing, prolonged fever, and temporary slowing of bowel activity. Death, although extremely rare, is always a risk of any surgery. After surgery, you will go to the recovery area or post-anesthesia care unit, PACU. No visitors are allowed in the PACU. As you awaken from the anesthetic, you may experience the following side effects. Blurred vision, dry mouth, chills, nausea, sore throat, and pain. Medication is available if you are having pain or nausea. The nurse will frequently check your blood pressure and pulse. It is normal to hear beeping of monitors that are checking and recording your vital signs. You will have oxygen running through a plastic tube in your nose. When you are awake and stable, you can be transported to the inpatient floor upstairs. You will be with us on the inpatient floor for one to two days. Welcome to the inpatient department of the Mount Carmel New Albany Surgical Hospital. Your room is equipped with many features to help you feel comfortable during your stay with us. Your bed and the room temperature are both adjustable to your comfort level. A call light system will allow you to let staff know when you need anything. In addition to cable TV and free wireless internet, each room is equipped with a DVD player, so feel free to bring your favorite movie from home. Our Founders Cafe offers an extensive room service menu available when the medical team says you're ready. The concierge will visit each day to bring your paper as well as assist with any questions you may have. Finally, there's a sleeper sofa in your room for a family member that may want to stay with you during your time with us. While we are in the room, let me take a moment to introduce you to the various people who will be caring for you during your stay with us. Each person on our team wears a specific color to signify their role in your care. Registered nurses are in royal blue. Techs are in maroon. Anesthesia personnel are in black. Physical therapists are in hunter green. Respiratory therapists wear pale blue. Case managers wear royal blue scrubs and a white lab coat. While you are here, our general medical physicians will be taking care of all your non-surgical needs. These physicians are available at all hours. They are similar to your family doctor. Beginning the day of surgery, you will receive a variety of treatments and medications to help you on your road to recovery. Treatments might include blood tests, EKGs, and or x-rays. A Foley catheter may be inserted into your bladder during your surgery. You may still have the catheter in place during your recovery. If so, it is usually removed early in the morning the day after your surgery. Medications will include antibiotics to help prevent infections and pain medication to help you remain as pain-free as possible. In addition, stool softeners and or laxatives may be used after surgery to help you regain and maintain normal bowel activity. The nurses will inquire about your bowel habits while you are in the hospital to help you with this. Nausea can be treated with anti-nausea medication. Most patients will receive a motion sickness patch behind their ear. If you have one, this patch will be removed the morning after surgery. Surgical infections can occur after surgery. Your doctor will order antibiotics to be given both before and after surgery to prevent infection. Signs of infection include increasing pain at rest and with activity, increasing swelling, redness, or tenderness in the area of your incision, persistent fever or chills, or drainage from the incision. You will be on oxygen for some time after surgery. It may be left in place when you go to the inpatient department or discontinued when the medical team determines that it is appropriate to do so. You may be connected to a heart monitor and you will have a sensor on your finger that measures your oxygen level. Your surgical dressing may be removed, changed, or reinforced. Pain medications can be given to you in many ways through your IV line, orally, or with a regional block anesthesia.
The nurse will ask you to rate your pain level during your recovery period. We use a pain scale, which goes from 0 to 10. 0 means no pain at all. 10 means the worst pain imaginable. Beside pain medication, there are other alternatives for pain relief, including watching TV, reading a good book, listening to tapes or music, and massage. Ice will be provided as ordered by your surgeon to minimize pain and swelling at the surgery site. Repositioning yourself frequently can also alleviate pain. Please do not wait until the pain is severe to ask for help. The more severe the pain, the harder it is to control. You may have some side effects from the anesthesia you have received or from your pain medication. Although your body gets rid of the anesthesia fairly quickly, the pain medication will continue to have an effect. The most common side effect is grogginess. Your thought processes and memory may be impaired for the first day or so. If a breathing tube was inserted during your surgery, you may experience hoarseness or a sore throat. These symptoms usually resolve on their own within 24 to 48 hours. Please let your nurse know if you have any questions related to anesthesia, your pain medication, or if you're experiencing nausea. On the day of your surgery, you will get ice chips. The medical team will determine when you are ready to resume eating solid foods. You will be given IV fluids until you are eating and drinking well or as needed to assist with your recovery. Blood clots can form in the leg veins after surgery. Signs of blood clots in the leg veins include increasing pain in the calf and back of the knee, increased swelling in the lower leg, and redness or tenderness along the inside of your calf or thigh. These blood clots can also travel to your lungs. Signs and symptoms of this include sudden shortness of breath, sudden chest pain, blood in your phlegm. To prevent this from happening, you will be encouraged to wear a mechanical device after surgery and to get up and walk and exercise. You will use this device at all times unless you are taking a shower. Your surgeon may also order a pair of white stockings called TED or TED hose. These stockings must be worn on your legs at all times. Your nurse, tech, and physical therapist will help you learn how to properly put on and wear TED hose. In order to prevent other post-surgical complications, such as pneumonia, our respiratory therapist will visit you frequently during your stay. Coughing, deep breathing, increasing activity, and the use of an incentive spirometer all help in preventing pneumonia. Please do your incentive spirometer exercises 10 to 15 times every hour, as these exercises are imperative due to the type of anesthesia you received. Physical therapy and exercises will be part of your post-operative routine and recovery. The day after your surgery will be similar to yesterday with some minor changes. Your surgeon and his or her partner will talk with you about your progress along with your general medical physician. Your medication may be changed. By now you may have progressed to solid foods. If so, a menu will be provided in your room so that you may order from our Founders Cafe. When you will be discharged will depend on your progress. You will not be discharged from the hospital until you have met your physical therapy goals and your doctor feels you are medically able to be released. A case manager will visit with you within 24 hours after your surgery in order to discuss your discharge from the hospital and what needs you will have at home. She will work with your insurance company to keep them informed of your care plan. Once your discharge goals have been met and upon the advice of your nurse, please arrange to have your ride arrive as early as possible. This will allow your discharge instructions to be given to you and your family member in a timely manner. Have someone stay with you at home for the first week, especially at night. Allow others to assist you with necessary tasks such as driving, cooking, cleaning, and shopping. Once you go home, you should call your doctor if you notice any of the following. Increased pain at the surgical site, edges of the incision are separating, nausea or vomiting, signs of infection, signs of a blood clot in your legs, burning when you urinate, or increased frequency of urination, nerve problems such as an inability to walk on your toes or heels, numbness or loss of bowel or bladder control, any other symptoms that concern you. When you are ready to go home, you will be given a list which contains all of your medications, those that you were taking before the surgery, and those prescribed by your surgeon. 
This list will contain instructions about when to resume taking your previous medications as well as how to take any new medications required after your surgery. There are many ways you can help yourself recover safely and more rapidly. First, you must participate in your recovery. No one can do this for you, although you will receive lots of assistance. You must communicate your pain levels so that adequate medication can be used to help you. You must follow your doctor's orders so that risks and complications will be minimal. Medication, mechanical devices worn around your calf, TED hose, blood tests, and exercises are prescribed to make your recovery as smooth and uneventful as possible. You must clearly communicate concerns about any aspect of your care and recovery so that problems can be addressed as quickly as possible. Remember that you are not sick. You've had surgery to help you walk and be more active again. We will give you the education, tools, and support you and your family need to succeed and have a rapid and safe recovery. In a healthy hip, the smooth ball on the end of the thigh bone fits well into the end of the hip socket to form the ball and socket joint. Cartilage cushions the ends of these bones, allowing the ball to glide easily in the socket. In a healthy knee, the hinge joint, or the upper leg femur, and the lower leg tibia connect, are surrounded by muscles and ligaments which support weight and allow the joint to work properly. The cartilage that covers the ends of the bones allows them to glide together when bending the knee. Total joint replacement is indicated when severe pain or decreased movement affects the hip or knee joint and other forms of treatment are not successful. Most people having total joint replacement surgery suffer from osteoarthritis, a condition in which the cushion of cartilage lining the joint wears away. When this occurs, the joints become irritated and pitted as bone rubs against bone, almost like sandpaper. Total joint replacement replaces the old, worn joint with a new mechanical joint called a prosthesis. In the hip, an artificial ball replaces the head of the thigh bone, and an artificial cup replaces the worn cup for hip replacement. A stem is inserted into the thigh bone for stability. In the knee, the upper and lower knee components replace the roughened surfaces of the knee joint. The underside of the kneecap is also replaced. All prostheses, hip or knee, have smooth surfaces that fit together, allowing easy, smooth movement. Prosthesis components are made of either metal, plastic, ceramic, or a combination of these. Your doctor will recommend the type of prosthesis that he feels is best for you. The physical therapy department will help you to establish goals for your rehabilitation process, show you exercises to assist with increasing your range of motion and level of strength, and help you and your family prepare for your discharge from the hospital. If you arrive on the unit before 5 p.m. the day of your surgery, a physical therapist will talk with you about your plan of care and get you up and walking within your hospital room. If you come to the unit after 5 p.m., physical therapy will meet with you the morning after your surgery. Physical therapy will work with you twice each day, beginning the day after your surgery, once in the morning and once in the afternoon, until you achieve your therapy goals and your surgeon determines you are safe for discharge to home. Physical therapy will teach you how to get in and out of bed on your operative side, how to walk safely with your new joint, how to go up and down stairs, how to perform your home exercises correctly, how to maintain weight-bearing restrictions, and how to follow total joint precautions. It would be to your benefit to have a caregiver attend one of your physical therapy treatment sessions so they are familiar with how to assist you with your transfers, exercises, or with the stairs when you go home. They do not need to be present at every session. We will come to your room for your physical therapy sessions. You will recognize us by our Hunter Green Scrubs. You may need to purchase special equipment for your home to assist you as you recover. An elevated toilet seat, grab bars in the shower, shower bench, reachers, dressing sticks, long-handled shoehorns, and sock aids may also be helpful. Please bring any equipment you have to the hospital with you, such as your walker, crutches, or cane, if your doctor requires you to use them after your surgery. 
check with your insurance company as some of these items may be covered expenses. You may also want to bring a lightweight bathrobe to walk in the halls and a pair of loose-fitting shorts. For the day of discharge, have elastic waist pants or shorts, a loose-fitting shirt without buttons, and slip-on shoes. Prepare your home by removing throw rugs, purchasing an extended toilet seat, and moving frequently used items to within a level reach. Prepare your refrigerator with items you can easily lift. You may also want to arrange a first floor setup for sleeping the first few weeks after your surgery. Practice any exercises outlined in the book and practice using your walker. Long-term complications of knee or hip replacement surgery include wear of the plastic and or metal materials, loss of bone structure, loosening of the total implant, and instability of the hip or knee. Other bothersome problems may include stiffness, swelling, front knee pain, and muscle weakness. Your doctor, along with physical therapy, will work with you to prevent or alleviate these problems. There is a direct relationship between the commitment on your part to exercise and the degree of success you will achieve in your recovery. These exercises may seem hard at first, but they will get easier the more you do them. Remember to look at your recovery in the long term. Some days will be better than others and you may have a setback or two, but by continuing to exercise you will have the best chance at a full recovery. The following are exercises you practice with us at the hospital and continue to do once you go home. Walker. Move the walker forward so that the back legs of the walker are in line with the tips of your toes. With all four walker legs firmly on the ground, step forward with your operated leg or the leg you feel is the weaker leg if you had an operation on both legs. Place a foot in the middle of the walker area. Do not move it past the front feet of the walker. Step forward with your non-operated leg to the same level of the operative leg. Take small steps. Do not take a step until all four walker legs are flat on the floor. Standing. Sit in a chair with armrests if possible. Slide your hips forward to the edge of the chair, bed, or toilet seat. Keep your operative leg straight and your good leg underneath you. Use your arms to push down on the edge of the bed, chair arms, or toilet seat and lift yourself up. If sitting without an armrest, place one hand on the walker while pushing off the side of the bed, chair, or toilet seat with the other. Shift your weight onto your good leg and move your hands to the hand grips of the walker. Bring your operative leg back and into alignment as you fully straighten your good leg. Do not pull yourself up with the walker because the walker may tip backwards. Make sure you are steady and balanced before taking a step. If you have had both joints replaced at the same time, scoot yourself forward and push down with both of your arms, straightening the elbows. Lift yourself off the chair and gradually walk yourself back and underneath of you. Transfer your weight from your arms to your legs and take hold of the walker. Sitting. Slowly back up to the chair, bed, or commode until you feel it against the back of your legs. One hand at a time, reach back for the chair arms, bed, or elevated toilet seat while sliding your operative leg forward. Slowly lower yourself onto the chair, bed, or toilet seat by leaning forward and keeping your operative leg outstretched in front of you. Gently lower yourself so that you do not plop down into the chair and gradually slide your operated leg forward. Keep your walker within easy reach. Going upstairs. Approach the stairs and place your feet two inches from the first step. Lift the walker and set it to the back of the step. If you only have one railing on your steps, fold the walker and place it in one hand. Place your other hand on the rail. Step up first with your good leg and then bring your operative leg up to the same step. At the top of the stairs, unfold the walker and set it on the landing. Make sure you hear the walker click into locked position. Step up first with your good leg and then bring up your operative leg. Going downstairs. 
approach the stairs and place your walker about two inches from the top step. If you only have one railing on your steps, fold the walker and place it in one hand. Place your other hand on the rail. Set the folded walker down and to the front edge of the step. Step down first with your operative leg and then bring down your good leg to the same step. At the bottom of the stairs, unfold the walker and set it on the landing. Make sure you hear the walker click into locked position. Place both hands on the walker. Step down first with your operative leg and then with your good leg. Proceed with your walk. Crutches. Standing. Slide your hips forward to the edge of the chair, bed, or toilet seat. Keep your operative leg straight and your good leg underneath you. Place both crutches in the hand on your operative side by grasping the hand pieces with your palm turned downward. Raise yourself up by pushing down on the crutches in your one hand and down on the bed, chair arm, or elevated toilet seat with your other hand. Bear weight on your good leg as you stand. When you are standing, place one crutch under each arm. For ease and balancing, your crutches should be slightly forward and about three inches out on each side of your feet. It is very important to place your weight on your hands. You should not be leaning or placing your weight on your armpits. Your crutches will be adjusted to the appropriate height by your therapist. Walking. Place both crutches ahead of you at a comfortable distance, usually about a foot. Step forward with your operative leg. With bilateral joint replacement, it does not matter which foot you use to begin your steps. Step with your good leg, bringing it through the crutches and past the operative leg as with a normal step. Move your crutches forward to balance. Continue to walk by repeating the above steps. Remember to keep your weight on your hands, not your armpits. Also, remember to look up and ahead of you. Sitting. Back up to the chair, bed, or commode until you feel it against the back of your leg. With the hand on your operative side, grasp both crutches by the hand pieces with your palm down. Slide your operative leg slightly ahead of you. Reach back with the hand on your good side for the chair arm, bed, or elevated toilet seat. Lower yourself slowly onto the bed, chair, or commode. Be careful not to plop down. Place your crutches within easy reach. Going upstairs. Allow approximately two inches between your feet and the first step. Push down on your crutches and step up with your good leg. Place your weight on your good leg, then bring your crutches and operative leg up to that step. Take a few moments to get your balance. Going downstairs. On the upstairs landing, rest your operative leg forward on the edge of the step. Put both crutches on the step below. Place the crutches near the front edge of the step to help you keep your balance. Bring your operative leg down to the step with the crutches. Push down on your crutches and slowly lower your good leg to the same step. If there is a railing on the stairs, you also have the option to put one crutch under one arm and use the railing for support. Follow the same instructions for stepping down each step. Cane. Walking. Cane length should be adjusted so that when you are standing, the handle of the cane is at the level of your wrist. Hold the cane on the side of your good leg unless directed otherwise by your physical therapist. Begin by stepping forward with your operative leg and cane, keeping the two in parallel alignment. Next, step forward with your good leg, bringing it ahead of the operative leg and cane. Going upstairs. Grasp the handrail with your free hand. Begin by raising your good leg up to the front step. Bring your operative leg and cane together up to the same step, keeping leg and cane in parallel alignment. Going downstairs. Approach the stairs and put your feet near the steps. Place your cane on the first step down. Place your operative leg on the first step down. Then bring your good leg to the same step. Repeat the same steps until you are at the bottom of the stairs. 
Your therapist will practice stairs with you before you are discharged and help you determine which method is the safest for you. Ankle pumps. Ankle or calf pumps help to aid circulation and the return of blood from the veins back to the heart. Point your toes and feet away from you, then pull them back toward you. With each movement, contract your muscles strongly and firmly. Quadricep sets. Quadricep sets aid in maintaining muscle tone and increasing circulation. Tighten your top thigh muscles for five seconds, then relax. If you are unable to get a contraction of your muscle, place a small towel under your foot and then try to press the back of your knee into the bed. Gluteal sets. Gluteal sets help in maintaining muscle tone and circulation. Pinch or squeeze your buttock muscles together and hold for five seconds, then relax. Hip abduction. Lie down on a bed. Keep your toes pointed towards the ceiling. Slide your operative leg out to the side, like opening a pair of scissors. Then slowly return your leg to the original position. Be careful not to cross the midline of your body. If you are unable to do this exercise without assistance yet, have someone place either a trash bag or a piece of smooth cardboard under your operative leg to reduce friction. Straight leg raises. Lie on your back with your operative leg straight and your other knee bent. Do a quadricep set with a straight leg, tightening the front of the thigh. Lift your operative leg 12 to 24 inches off the bed. Keep your knee straight. Slowly lower your leg. Short arc quads. Bend your knee over a towel roll or a three pound coffee can. Lie on your back. Lift your heel straightening your knee. Be careful not to raise your leg off the roll. Straighten your leg as much as possible. Pause, then lower your leg. Heel slides. While lying on your back, slide your heel toward your buttocks and bend at the knee. Do not attempt to lift your heel off the surface or rotate your leg in or out. Your knee should be pointing towards the ceiling. Pause and then slide your heel forward and straighten the knee. Side Lying Leg Lifts Lie on your good side. You may bend your good leg at the knee if you need extra support. Lead with the heel and raise your operative leg 12 inches off of the bed, keeping your knee straight and toes pointing forward. Be sure to roll forward to keep your hips slightly forward when lifting the leg. Hold and then slowly lower your leg. Hip flexion with straight leg. Stand and hold on to a firm surface. Raise your operative leg forward while keeping your leg straight. Standing hip extension. Stand upright and hold on to a firm surface. Bring your leg back as far as possible, keeping your knee straight. Stand upright. Standing hip abduction. Stand facing a counter. Lift your leg out to the side, leading with your heel, keeping your toes pointed forward. Keep the knee straight. Return your leg to the starting position. Hip flexion. Stand and march in place. You may hold on to a counter for balance if necessary. Knee extension. Sit on a chair or the side of the bed. Place a hand on the thigh of your operative leg. While pressing down on your thigh, lift your heel and attempt to straighten your knee. Lower your heel. Larynx extension exercise. Support your operative leg with your good leg by placing your foot under the heel. Try to straighten your operative leg while using your good leg to help as needed. Larynx flexion exercise. Cross your good leg over your operative leg at the ankle. Try to bend your operative leg while helping with your good leg. Foot slide. Sit in a chair and place your foot of the operative leg on a plastic bag. Slide your foot back and forth on the plastic, bending your knee as much as you can. Knee seat slide. Sit on a chair or the edge of a bed 
and stabilize your foot against some type of surface, such as a wall. Press down with your arms and gently slide forwards towards your feet and hold for 15 seconds.